For years, we've all been begging Canon to give us a 200 to 600 millimeter lens. And now they've not only done that, but added an extra 200 millimeters on top, basically giving you a free teleconverter. Pretty amazing, right? Over the last few weeks, I've been using this lens extensively in the field in quite diverse conditions and with different camera bodies. And I got some quite nice and surprising results. So why don't we take a look and see how this lens performs in the field and whether it can lift up to the hype or if it's too limited by its rather slow f-stop in the real world. When you grab the 200 to 800 millimeter lens for the first time, you'll notice that it's not a small lens, definitely much larger and heavier than the 100 to 500 millimeter lens, for instance. But at the same time, it's still quite hand holdable at around two kilos or 4.5 pounds. Compared to the competition, the lens weighs a little bit less than Sony's 200 to 600 millimeter lens and a little bit less than Nikon's 180 to 600 millimeter lens, but it gives you 200 extra millimeters on the long end, which is quite remarkable. The price of the 200 to 800 millimeter lens is also quite competitive with 1899 US dollars, which sits right between the Nikon and the Sony lens. But with these two lenses, you have to buy an expensive teleconverter to get to 800 millimeters, whereas on the Canon lens, you're basically getting that for free. Speaking about the price, the 200 to 800 millimeter lens you see me using in this video, I bought with my own money and it was not supplied by Canon. Even though the lens is wide and looks like an L lens, it's not part of Canon's top of the line L series, which comes with a couple drawbacks we will speak about later in this video. The first thing that stands out about the lens is the quite large lens foot. Now, if you carry that lens in the field, it's actually quite nice to hold it by the foot. But if you're traveling and you try to squeeze the lens into a small backpack, having that sort of bulky foot that sticks out quite a bit as well can be an issue, I think. The lens foot can actually not be removed. And I really don't have any idea why the big three brands don't make their lens fit Arca Swiss star because that would be so much more handy and would save us a lot of hassle in the field. Unlike most Canon RF lenses, this lens doesn't come with a dedicated control ring. It does have a manual focus ring towards the back of the lens, which can also be assigned to be a control ring, but then you're losing the ability to manually focus in the field, and that's something that I don't like. Because for instance, if your camera gets stuck on the background, having the ability to quickly manually interfere is very important for me. If you like using a control ring on a camera like an R7 or an R8, for instance, that doesn't have three wheels, you have the option to turn a switch on the lens and assign the control ring function to the manual focus ring. However, in this lens, the manual focus ring is actually very far on the back of the lens and it's quite hard to reach in the field. You kind of have to sort of move your thumb back and then feel for it and find it. Besides the manual focus ring, the lens also comes with the loosened and tightened ring that you're used to seeing from the 100 to 500 millimeter lens. We can also find some customizable lens function buttons on the lens. The minimum focusing distance on this lens goes from 0.8 meters or 2.6 feet at the 200 millimeter mark to 3.3 meters or 10.8 feet at the 800 millimeter mark. Now 3.3 meters isn't amazing, but if you compare it to some other lenses, it's also not that bad. And I definitely didn't have any issues in the field. To get to the amazing 800 millimeters, you have to zoom out, of course. And this takes a little bit of effort on this external zoom lens because you basically have to turn the zoom ring four times to get from 200 all the way to 800 millimeters. I also find the zoom ring a little bit stiff, even on the looser setting. So zooming in and out definitely takes a little bit more effort on this lens. And while it's not a deal breaker, at times in the field, it made photographing a little bit more difficult, especially when it comes to birds and flight and action photography. What's obviously unique and stands out about this lens is the ability to get to 800 millimeters without using a talent converter. The main other lens that can offer that is probably the Canon F11 800mm lens, but this new lens is basically superior in every regard. Now it costs more and weighs more and it's a bit larger, but at the same time it has a faster f-stop and offers you the whole autofocusing area rather than the small box that you get with the 800 f11 lens. After this first review of the lens, I'll definitely also make a comparison video of the 200 to 800 compared to the 100 to 500, 100 to 500 with teleconverters and some other popular lenses. So make sure to subscribe and not miss any updates. Unlike some of Canon's cheaper lenses, this lens does actually come with a lens hood that helps you to protect your lens when you're walking through bushes, for instance, or from rain. Speaking about rain, I've used this lens in the rain and it gotten pretty wet a few times. And so far, it has survived. When the lens gets wet, I usually try to wipe the lens barrel that protrudes out before zooming back in, but 
other than that, I haven't really done anything special to protect the lens from the rain, and so far it has held up very well. Of course, this doesn't mean that the lens will always survive, but at the moment, I feel like it's fairly well weather sealed, or I shouldn't say weather sealed because Canon says it's weather resistant, whatever that means, but so far, at least in my case, it definitely has been weather resistant, which is good to know because with these lenses, it's very likely they get wet from time to time, and I'm happy to report that at least thus far, it has held up pretty well. The first few days after I received the lens, I spent photographing with my good mate Dwight, and I mainly used the 200 to 800 in combination with the R7. I instantly loved the reach on the R7 because I could get even tiny songbirds quite large in my frame, and the image stabilization also made the viewfinder nice and stable, but I encountered some autofocus struggles, unfortunately. When photographing small birds like this hooded robin or this rufous whistler, the autofocus would routinely just sort of wander off my subject. I would have good focus, and then suddenly it would almost completely defocus and I had to let go and refocus again to keep shooting. And this would happen quite regularly and was quite frustrating. Now, if you're on an R7, you're probably familiar with some of the autofocus inconsistencies also on other lenses. So it was expected to a degree, but I would have just hoped that with a brand new lens, it might be slightly better. Even though in this case, I don't think it's the lens that should take the blame, but rather the camera body that seems to be a little bit limited when it comes to the autofocus inconsistency. Now I'm not saying it was all bad with the R7 because I definitely got some nice and sharp photos that showed great colors and beautiful fine detail, but at the same time I had to take larger bursts to be able to get enough sharp photos. When you read about the rather slow aperture of f9, a lot of people also assume that the backgrounds would be very busy on this lens and that it would be hard to get nice and smooth and out of focus backgrounds, but I didn't really find that to be too much of an issue in the field, even when the background was quite close, because I think the quite narrow field of view of the 800mm definitely helps to make even somewhat busy and close backgrounds still look pretty smooth. Now it's definitely not an f4 600mm prime lens when it comes to the look of the backgrounds, they are definitely smooth on those lenses, but if you position yourself well in the field, you'll definitely be able to get fantastic looking smooth backgrounds also with this lens. To see how the 200 to 800 mm lens would perform with other camera bodies, I started to use it with my R5s and my R3, and I immediately noticed a big difference. The autofocus was a lot more sticky, and as a result, I got a lot more consistently sharp photos that showed beautiful, nice, and fine detail. Now, I did get nice and sharp photos with the R7 as well, but the keeper rate with the R5 and the R3 was dramatically higher. So after the first few days with the lens, I was somewhat undecided how I was liking it because I was getting some fantastic images, but I also had some struggles when it came to the autofocus consistency and the image quality. The image quality issues that I noticed after the first few days seemed to revolve around some bright spots in the photos blowing out really quickly and bright backgrounds somewhat sort of bleeding into my subjects, but more on that later. To get an understanding of how this lens can truly perform in the fields and where its limitations may lie, I decided to take it to a real shoot of a difficult and hard to photograph bird that lives in deep dark rainforest, the pink robin. I knew photographing this colorful and tiny bird would push this lens to the extreme because I would have to use quite high ISOs and the autofocus would have to stay on the tiny little fast bird in these low light conditions. So to me, this was the ultimate test to see if I can trust this lens in the field or not, because I knew if I was getting photos of this bird and afterwards they weren't up to my usual standard, I would be pretty disappointed and wouldn't want to use the lens anymore. So it was truly game on. What followed was a truly amazing afternoon because I was able to find a quite tame pink robin that was hopping in front of me from branch to branch, allowing me to test the lens to the extreme, getting some great photos and videos. Even though I had to use higher ISOs of up to 12,800, I immediately noticed on the back of my R5 when zooming in that the images looked quite nice and sharp and the detail was also still there even at these high ISO levels. It was also a relief to see that the autofocus even in these low light conditions on the R5 worked very well. And if you guys want to improve your image editing, get more confident when it comes to editing, and get the most out of some difficult to edit images, I would highly recommend that you check out my Pro Sets and my Masterclass. With my Pro Sets, I allow you with just one click to get amazing results out of your RAW files, and in my Masterclass, I teach you step by step everything you need in Photoshop to get amazing results. So if you want to get more confident when it comes to image editing and get the best results possible, make sure to check these out down there in the description. 
One important feature when it comes to new lenses for me is always the image stabilization and I'm happy to report that it works very well on the R7 and even better on the R5 and the R3. The viewfinder is basically rock solid, nice and stable which makes it easy to photograph and you can also do nice handheld shooting of low shutter speeds within reason. Now when it comes to handheld video, the R7 definitely was a little bit less stable than the R5 and the R3, but even on the R7 I was able to achieve some nice handheld and relatively shake free video. When it comes to handheld video, that can definitely be achieved with this lens as well, but actually it has kind of two faces, one good one and one bad one. Because oftentimes when you start filming, it will be very shaky and it just feels like the image stabilization is not working at all until you give it a bit of a shake or kind of whack the lens a little bit and then it seems to click into position and it's nice and stable and almost shake free. So I don't know why this is happening but if you feel like you're hand holding and it's shaky, shaking the lens actually seems to then make it more stable for whatever reason. For this price point, I think the image stabilization is fantastic and the viewfinder was nice and stable on all my camera bodies and as I said, handheld video was also quite workable. Why don't we address the big elephant in the room now, the relatively slow f-stop of the lens of f8 at 600mm and then f9 at 7 and 800mm. I must say that personally I don't find it too limiting in the field because I don't have any problems to push my eyes out high enough to get good enough shutter speeds and I'm also liking to stop down anyways because I like to have enough depth of field on my subjects to make sure that the whole subject is sharp. So in the case of the 100 to 500 millimeter lens or the 200 to 800 millimeter lens in this case, I never really struggled too much with it in the field. I think it's definitely workable, especially if you have a camera body like the R5 where you can get really nice and clean files, even at ISO 6400 for instance. And if you run them through like Dix or Pure Raw 3 and use my process, you will definitely still get fantastic results. And it makes using a lens like this, even in low light conditions, very doable. Now, some of you guys will say you live in Australia, you have always bright sun, but that's definitely not the case. If you look at my images, you will notice that I usually shoot in dark forest and overcast conditions. So low light shooting is definitely a concern for me, but because I like enough depth of field, I almost never would shoot at something like f2.8 or f4 anyway. So having an f-stop in that f9 range isn't ideal, but it's definitely not a deal breaker for me. And sometimes all you need to do is think about your backgrounds while you're shooting, for instance. If you're standing at one spot and you feel like the background is just too busy, oftentimes you can just step a few steps to one side and you get a much smoother background, like in this pink robin example, for instance. So if you're aware of your backgrounds while you're shooting and you position yourself well in the field, getting smooth backgrounds with this lens is definitely not a problem. Why I found the slow f-stop a little bit more limiting was in combination with the R7 because that camera has a more limited ISO range and I usually don't like to go above ISO 3200 with that camera or ideally not above ISO 1600. So I think for low light photography with the 200 to 800 millimeter lens, a camera like an R6 Mark II or an R5, R3 or even an R8 for instance are better suited than an R7 simply because the autofocus will slightly work better and you also have a little bit more of a usable eyes all range to give you a bit more faster shutter speed in these low light situations. Since I had such an amazing opportunity with this pink robin and it actually hung around for quite a while, I decided to try something completely crazy. So I grabbed my 2x extender and put it on the 200 to 800 millimeter lens giving me an f18 wide open lens now this doesn't sound like something you would want to use in the field but to my shock and surprise i was actually able to get some beautiful headshots of the pink robin and because it let me get right to the minimum focusing distance i was able to get these shots basically full frame of a tiny little amazing looking sunbird that's quite incredible isn't it now using the two times extender on the 200 to 800 millimeter lens is not necessarily something that I would recommend because the autofocusing area is quite small and you're wide open at f18. So it's not something that will work in a lot of situations, but if you're super close to tame bird like I was for instance, you can actually get some quite unique images with that combo. When it comes to the use of teleconverters in general on this lens, it definitely works well and the autofocus is also still fast. But like with all teleconverters, you always have to remember that distance matters. If you're trying to photograph something that's already too far away and you're adding a teleconverter, image quality will likely suffer. Whereas if you're quite close to a bird and you want to take a headshot for instance, you will get some fantastic results with the teleconverters. 
The other day when we were traveling down to Melbourne, we drove past a picnic area that had a lot of sulfur crested cockatoos hanging out in the trees around it. And so I quickly jumped out of the car, grabbed my R5, the 200-800mm lens and also 1.4 extender and started shooting away. First, I encountered a beautiful sulfur crested cockatoo sitting on a nice little branch that allowed me to get some cool shots of different focal length and the image quality even at these high ISOs are quite nice. And then out of nowhere, I noticed that one of the cockatoos had landed on the picnic table. And whenever these cockatoos land, they will raise their crest for just a couple seconds. So I ripped my lens around and I was able to get this shot of the cockatoo with the crest open. Because some of these cockatoos were quite tame, I was also able to test the lens with the extender and without extender on some birds with the R5 and the R7. And the results overall were very nice. Now again, these birds were quite close, so you will definitely get the best image quality. When it comes to the image stabilization with extenders, it's definitely a little bit worse than with the bare lens, which makes sense because you're zooming in more and more and more, adding more focal length. So naturally it will be harder for the camera to stabilize such a picture. So handheld video, for instance, with 1120 millimeters is a lot more difficult than with like 800 or 600 millimeters, simply because it will be a lot more shaky. Now with the 1.4 extender, we have an f-stop of f13, and we can still use most of the autofocus in air, which is great. But at the same time, f13 wide open is obviously a bit of a challenge in the field. Most of you already say that f9 is a challenge, so f13 is definitely a challenge. You need nice enough light to be able to get good results. What I love about the 200 to 800 millimeter lens in combination with the teleconverters is that you still have the full zoom range available, unlike you on the 100 to 500 millimeter lens, for instance. So it's a much better design in that regard. So to sum it up, the lens is definitely the best without teleconverters, but with the 1.4 extender, it works quite well. And in certain situations, it will also work quite well with the two times extender. But overall, I would probably try to use the lens with extenders as little as possible because that will give you the best results. The autofocus is not as fast as on some of Canon's best lenses, like the 100 to 500, for instance, but it's right up there and definitely usable in the field. The best test for the autofocus is obviously action photography, but I didn't really know where to go down here in Melbourne. But then the other day, I randomly stumbled up on this crested turn colony, giving me amazing opportunities for birds and flight videos and also intimate shots and videos of the turns with their little babies. It was truly one of those magical moments in the field with the sun setting right behind the bird's colony, giving me some magical light and some amazing opportunities. I used the Turner to 800mm lens on the R5 and the R7 and both cameras managed to lock onto the turns very well, giving me much more accurate results than in low light, especially the R7 performed very well locking onto these brighter and whiter and bigger birds very well and with the more sunny conditions I also didn't have as many of the autofocus struggles that I encountered in low light and I got this image of the turn flying close by that I really like because you can kind of see a bit of the habitat in the background as well. Birds in flight and action photography was one area where the long throw of the lens and the quite stiff throw definitely made it a little bit more difficult to photograph because it is a struggle to find a bird with 800 or 1280 millimeters on the R7. So I usually zoom back, find the bird and then quickly zoom back in. And because the throw is so long and stiff, I often would lose the bird in the zooming back process. So it took a little bit of getting used to. I definitely got a lot of nice shots still, but I would have liked a little bit shorter throw and a little bit easier to zoom, zoom ring to be able to more quickly zoom in and out when it comes to action for photography. I also took many many videos of the turns flying past and coming in and feeding the babies and while it was very easy to do with the slow motion I struggled at times with the videos in normal speed because the lens is so long and zooms out a fair bit it didn't seem to be the most stable so handheld video and even video on a tripod were a little bit shaky because the wind would easily find the lens as a target and started to shake it so i would probably have to use a much bigger much heavier tripod and lock everything down or zoom out a bit more to be able to get more shake free video but even with some of these small struggles i still managed to get some amazing photos and videos that afternoon and left super happy as you've seen throughout this video, you can definitely take some great images with the camera and the image quality is pretty good overall as well. However, this lens is not an L lens and when it comes to image quality, this seems like where it shows the most. 
At first, I couldn't really put my finger on it what was strange about some of the images that I was taking, but after using the lens extensively in the field, I realized what was going on. Likely because the lens doesn't have some of the coatings that L lenses have, it seems to be quite affected by bright areas in your photos. These areas tend to blow out quite quickly and they also show some flaring and fringing. For instance, on the first day I was photographing a Wolfus Whistler with a rather bright background and I just noticed how somehow the background seemed to bleed in onto the bird overall, giving me a bit of a hazy feel. Now this is probably not something that most people would ever notice or a reason not to buy this lens. But for me personally and how picky I can be with my photos, it's definitely something that I notice quite quickly on the back of the camera and especially when looking at the images on the computer. And overall, it simply made it a little bit more tricky to expose my images in the field at times because I had to underexpose more than usually to keep these areas under control. Besides that issue, the lens really impressed me in the field because image quality overall and especially sharpness is excellent even at 800 millimeters and stopping down only marginally increases image quality. So even wide open at 800 millimeters, this lens delivers excellent results. When zooming back, you notice that the lens gets slightly sharp at 600 and 700 millimeters, but not to the point where you feel like it's better to shoot zoom back. Shooting wide open at 800 millimeters or especially slightly stop down to f10 or f11 will definitely also give you fantastic results. For the price point, I think image quality and sharpness are excellent and almost more than I expected. Now it's not an L lens, so there's some drawbacks that are to be expected, like the lack of some of these coatings, but overall I was very impressed how the lens performed. Ultimately, this is an amazing lens and I know many people will be very happy with it in the field. Because when it comes to wildlife and bird photography especially, nothing beats reach and this lens has plenty of it. You can zoom all the way out to 800mm or at the teleconverters and go to over 1000mm and beyond. Or you combine it with an R7 and get even more crazy reach. So you finally have a small and light package lens from Canon that can actually give you that reach that you have been craving in the field. So when it comes to size, reach and flexibility, this lens is basically second to none. And combine that with a very attractive price point, I think for many people this lens is basically a no-brainer. So for me personally, I will definitely keep this lens around because I had a lot of fun with it in the field and despite some small issues encountered, I overall really liked what I saw. It's not going to replace any of my other lenses, but it's a very welcome addition to my lens lineup when, for instance, 100 to 500 is a bit too short and I don't want to get out my big f4 600 millimeter prime lens. So in these situations when I just want to walk around or I'm not sure what I'm going to encounter, having a lens that goes from 200 all the way to 800 millimeters or even beyond that will be fantastic and something that I will definitely use from time to time. And when I started out back in the day, many decades ago, I would have loved to have a lens like this, giving me an amazing reach of up to 800 millimeters and beyond. What do you guys think about this lens? Have you bought one? Are you planning to buy one? Are you gonna buy one after this review? Are you waiting for one? Let me know in the comments. I think this lens is a fantastic addition to the Canon lineup, finally giving us a 200 to 600 millimeter lens with an additional 200 bonus millimeters on top. So I'm pretty stoked to have that lens finally in my hand and to be able to use it in the field. I hope you enjoyed this review. I hope you get something out of it. And if you do, give me that thumbs up. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Check out my channel membership and hit that subscribe button. And I will see you guys in the next video very soon. Bye.